job reading all those names. Did you look read the chapter before tonight or no? Did it just kind of go through it? Because <laughs> you did a good job. There's a lot of uh, a lot of funny names sometimes in these chapters in the Bible, and I don't I don't intentionally try to throw anyone under the bus. We got a pretty good uh, routine here now with people reading the scripture, but um, I know I've been called up a couple times on some chapters that have been a little difficult with the names, but. Um, so yeah, we see here in chapter 4, verse number 1, So King Solomon was king over all Israel. And there were, and these were the princes which he had. Now, oftentimes, and I don't know if it's just our culture or whatever, people think, see the word prince and you think like it's just the son of the king or something. Like they're the prince and they're next in line to take the throne. But that prince is really just like a, like a first officer, like someone who's, principle, someone who is a very high up there leader. So what, what we're seeing here, it's, in a way, it's kind of like his cabinet, if you want to put it in terms of like the, the United States government, right? If he's a president and this is like his cabinet, these are his, his top officials, the top ranking guys for the various areas that he needs help with. And one of the things you're going to notice as we go through these names is that a lot of these people are actually transferred over just from the former reign of David, his father. And there's definitely some differences here, but what he's done is he kept, he's kept a lot of people who are, uh, who are close to him and had their loyalty to the family, to David especially, and then to Solomon, um, you know, throughout their lifetime. So some of these people are much older. Oh, and I just want to correct something for, I said, I think it was last week, and I kind of just said it off the top of my head when Solomon asked for wisdom and I, and I said that he wasn't just like, you know, he, he said to God humbly, you know, that he was like a child. And uh, I think I might have said, I don't even remember exactly now, I think I might have said he might have been like 40 years old. He's younger than that. David reigned for, for seven years and then for 33 years. Solomon was born during that time when he was reigning for 33 years. So he was probably anywhere in that range from 20 to 30, roughly. But, I mean, he's still not like a child, right? I mean, he's going to be an adult. We don't have the exact date on there. But I just wanted to throw that out there so he's getting an understanding. He's a, he's a young man, but not, uh, but not just, you know, he's not like a teenager. You see some of the kings you go through um, that became king at really young ages, even as young as eight years old. But um, so Solomon's probably in his 20s. Be a fair, a fair guess here. And what he's done, he's chosen these men to hold these various positions. And we'll go through this a little bit and, and see what we could glean off this. Nothing in the, in the Bible is by accident. There's always some learning that could be done, especially in some of these, heart, you know, these chapters where you get, just got a lot of names. I'm going to go through a few of these. And it's always good. I always love getting to know some of the characters in the Bible just a little bit better. You know, the more you read your Bible, you kind of get to know people a little bit more. And, you know, start off just getting some name recognition. Oh, I've heard that name before. And you start to learn a little bit more about what they did and who they are and then kind of how they're related to other people. You, you really could gain some, just some extra insight into things that are going on and learn some extra truths that are found in the Bible. Now, um... We're going to see here, he's got Azariah, the son of Zadok the priest, in verse number two. These are some of the princes, so it's his top people. And you'll notice, too, most of them are people who, they're, they're going to be godly in the sense that they're priests or they're related to priests. I mean, these are the people who are following the Lord, that he's surrounding himself with as a very wise move when, when um, you know, we saw in the Proverbs What's, that, what's the one that, uh, you know, the, the, basically the, the wicked, when the wicked are ruling, and, I'm, and I totally don't have the, the proverb in my head right now, but, um, you know, memorized. But basically that there's, you know, when the wicked's in charge, there's going to be a lot more wicked people surrounding that wicked ruler. And when the righteous are in charge, then you're going to have the exact opposite. And you don't want to have a righteous ruler with wicked people around you because then that'll corrupt that righteous ruler. So he's, he's doing his best here to get people who are going to be Dedicated to God as well as him in his, in his line and his family. So um, we've got Azariah, the son of Zadok the priest. Zadok was an extremely uh, loyal man and a, and a great man of God. We find all throughout the Bible he, was, he did a lot of good things. Uh, verse number three, Eli Horeph and Ahiah, the sons of Shisha, scribes. 
So these are scribes. Again, you, we'll just have to assume that they were godly people. I mean, they were doing God's work, being scribes. Uh, Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, the recorder. Ahilud is a name that you'll see multiple times in the Bible. Verse number four, And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the host. And Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. Now, Abiathar, we already saw earlier that Solomon ended up you know, kind of putting Abiathar out of the priest's office. And we went over, I think it was in chapter 2, where we went over uh, the reasoning for that. But I think early on, Abiathar was a priest, and then he, and then he got him out. It's probably why he's listed here. Because this, this might be taken just a step back to saying, here's who he appointed to these positions, right? So for a short period of time until he kicked Abiathar out from being the priest, he was... He was the, uh, one of the, the priests, along with Zadok. But um, Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, keep your finger here. Turn, if you would, to 2 Samuel chapter 23. I just want to point this out about who, um, who Benaiah was, because he's, uh, he's one of these carryovers from David's reign. In 2 Samuel 23, I, I love this chapter. I love reading it. And what it is, is if, if, you're not, you know, if it's not ringing a bell right now, this is the chapter where it goes through all of the David's mighty men. And it gives you all these stories of like the great things that they did and how they stood their ground and, and beat 400 Philistines with their bare hands. You know, like, like these great battle stories. Really exciting. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, is listed as one of these mighty men. He's actually really close to the top of like the mightiest men. Look at verse number 20. It says, And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabziel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. He went down also and slew a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. So not only did he, you know, he kill these two lion-like men of Moab, he actually killed a lion in a pit in, in, in the snow. And uh, verse 21 says, And he slew an Egyptian, a goodly man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, but he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah the son of Jehoiada and had the name among three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty, but he attained not to the first three. And David set him over his guard. So during the reign of David, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada was basically over his guard. His guard would be like his... Uh, like his, the people who are guarding the king, right? So that would be like his secret service or, you know, the, his, his, his close guards that would be around him at all time. And those guards, you know, you, you'll, you'll also see that he was the, the head. When you look up Benaiah, if you kind of search for Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and you kind of see everywhere he was in the Bible. I was doing, I was studying up on some of these people preparing for the sermon tonight just to get to know him a little bit better. Like I said, he was the head over the Kirathites and the Pelathites. And these were men that were loyal to David and had been with him through his time when he was on the run with Saul. So if you remember, David kind of started getting this band of men together as, after he left the king's house and just kind of went on the lamb because he was worried that Saul was just going to kill him for good reason. And Saul kept going after him. He, he was accumulating these men who were discontented with, with Saul and, you know, whatever, all these different people that were following David. And then he went off into the, into, um, <clears throat> into the land of the Philistines. And he had this group of guys. And, and that's who the, you know, the Kirathites and the Pelathites were were from that group from him like way early on. So they were dedicated him through, through thick and thin, even you know, through the time that, that Absalom tried to take over the kingdom all this time. I mean, these people were loyal to him way for, you know, for a very long time. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, he was the, the captain of that guard. He was in charge of all of those people. So that's who he is. And now what Solomon is doing, he's basically promoting him now to take the place of Joab. Joab was the captain of the host. And now that's where Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, is being put into that position. So he's got a really great position here, but he's been with this family and with, you know, with this cause for a very long time. Someone who's been very close to David as well as now to Solomon. Um, <clears throat> let's see. 1 Kings chapter 
4, verse number 4. We saw this already. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the host. And Zadok and Abiathar were the priests. Now, Zadok was also very faithful to David and Sol Solomon. Um, as Benaiah was. He stayed with him. And Zadok was the one who didn't get carried away when Adonijah, Solomon's brother, was trying to take over the kingdom. He stayed behind. He wasn't called to be with them because his loyalty was to Solomon and to David. So we see, you know, it's just really wise for him to be choosing these people as part of his group, right? I mean, those are, these are the people that are going to stay close to him and provide him with some of the best counsel. Verse number five, And Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers, and Zabad, the son of Nathan, was principal offer, officer, excuse me, and the king's friend. Now, I don't know this for a fact, but I, I, would, I would assume that since it's mentioning Nathan, there's not very many Nathans mentioned around this time frame, that it's talking about Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet, who was the one that came and told David, you remember, thou art the man, when, when he had committed adultery and murder with, uh, with Bathsheba and against uh, Uriah the Hittite. And again, we see these are, these are his sons, these are his children that he is appointing to be real close to him, to have these high uh, um, offices within the kingdom. And it even says there of, of the, one of Nathan's sons, Zabad, that he was the king's friend. So not only was he a, a high official, but he's someone that he confided with as being a friend. Now let's, uh, let's keep reading through some of these. Verse number 6, And, and Ahishar was over the household, and Adoniram, the son of Abda, was over the tribute. Now I, was, I tried to look up most of these people, or all these people. You can't find very much about the rest of them. So it's, it's kind of difficult to figure out you know, exactly who they are. But for the most part, we see a lot of transition from from David's, uh, you know, mighty man and David's people he had in close with him. Now Solomon is keeping them and retaining that wisdom from uh, from the previous reign. Verse number, as in it, which is in contrast with Rehoboam, and we'll get to that later when we get to when we get to cover Rehoboam. But he basically forsook all of the old counsel of the of the of the wise men. People have been around a while; they understand the way things work, and he rejected it. But see, Solomon had wisdom, even though he was a younger man. See, the problem with the youth these days, they have a tendency to think that, you know, the older guys don't know what they're talking about. And they kind of reject the wisdom that older people have just from experience alone. Now, I'm not saying that the older generation is just always right. You know, in their approach, sometimes people end up going soft or they end up going the wrong direction. But there's still wisdom to be had there. I mean, I don't care who you are. <coughs> the hoary head, you ought to have some respect for them, uh, and especially when, when it's found in the way of righteousness. They'll have a lot of wisdom for you. But people have been around for a while. Even if they're wicked, you gain knowledge. You gain wisdom. You, you, you gain understanding and learning, just about the, at least about the way the world works over some time. And we need, especially young people, you need to have respect for that. You need to realize that you are nothing, there's nothing new under the sun. There is nothing that you're going through that other people haven't gone through. There's nothing that is just so unique to you that hasn't been done before. And typically, people who are older have a lot more experience and, get, and gain knowledge, even if it's not them going through it, but other people that they know have gone through things. So it's, there's a lot to be learned there. And... Um, the wise thing to do when you're younger is to, is to seek the counsel of, uh, of people who have been through a lot and people who are, who are much more older. Let's keep going here. Uh, verse number 7, And Solomon had 12 officers over all Israel, which provided victuals for the king and his household. Each man, his month in a year, made provision. So, there's 12 months, he's got 12 officers, and they are basically assigned different regions of Israel. And their job is once in a month, for the month, they need to be bringing the, the supplies for the king's house, the, the food and everything else that he's going to need to eat. That's what the vittles are. It's, it's food that, um, for his household, for the king and his household. And um, it goes through their names. I'm not going to read through all of them. You'll notice there's a couple of people he's appointed who married some of his daughters, so they, they've kind of joined. He's got son-in-laws that are appointed as officers, and then some other people that he's just relying on and trusting in to get this done. Let's just jump down to, because we already read it beforehand, and there's not too much, uh, you know, just a lot of geography of what area these people are covering. 
But I want to point out here in verse number 19, Geber, the son of Uri, was in the country of Gilead, in the country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and of Og, king of Bashan. If you remember, that, era, that region was the like some of the first regions uh, where they won victory over over Og and Sion, and that was probably a pretty big realm because they were they were king, they were two different kingdoms, the two kings that they they reigned over, and it was a big area. And it says, and he was the only officer which was in the land. And what I think what this is trying to, to say here is that the the people and 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 Israel was in such a good state the people were you know were doing so well and things were going so great they were at peace and these are basically what they these officers are as tax collectors these are the guys that go out and say like okay you know give me give me the tax money these are not people that are generally liked by anyone ever because who likes to pay taxes Nobody does. Now, we're a little bit removed from this in our society because the, the, the thieves have gotten really sneaky in the way they're able to do it and just take it directly from your paycheck before you even get it to try to make it sting a little bit less as it, you, know, you, don't, you don't feel it coming out. But throughout time, it hasn't been that easy. You know, there's not all this digital technology and, and, and currency that's, that's just stored in a computer somewhere. But... Um, it was done physically. I mean, people had to go out and collect this stuff. But what he's saying here, for this whole realm, this whole region, one guy was able to do it. He, didn't, he, didn't, he wasn't coming across problems with people. People were basically paying gladly. I mean, by and large, not a big deal, not a problem, because everything was going well. When a country's being prosperous and everybody's making money and God's blessing you, it's not that big of a deal. You don't have that many people complaining about it and getting away with only having 12 tax collectors for that entire nation, it's all he needed because things were going so well. And I think that's, what, you know, that's why it makes that point there that you know, for that whole land, he was the only officer. That's, that's all that was required in order to maintain that whole area of bringing in what was uh, required for the king. And you know, we saw, and I'm not going to turn there, but Samuel warned the people when they asked for a king, look, this is what a king's going to do. This is what you're signing up for when you're rejecting God as being your king and you want to have a man to rule over you. Well, guess what? Prepare yourself. Here's what you're going to have because he's going to tax you. He's going to take your children. He's going to take, you know, he's going to need people to run his kingdom. And don't complain about it then when, when this stuff starts to happen. They weren't taxed previously in the in the reign of the judges before they had kings they were free all that was required of them under god's law was just to bring their first fruits to bring their increase and to offer sacrifice unto the lord which maintained the levites but even then we don't see any criminal punishment for not doing that that gets you out of good graces with god and god dealt with them and god judged them but it wasn't like it was against law, but now you got a king. Guess what's going to happen when you don't pay your taxes? It's very similar to when you don't pay your taxes here. They're going to lock you up and they're going to throw you in a cage. right? And then they, they probably would do even worse things then. But when things are going well, and even in your own life, you know, you look at the taxes, it's not, it's not as big of a burden. It's not that big of a deal when everything's going great and you just seem to be being blessed. <coughs> and that's the way that it was in the kingdom during the time of Solomon. They didn't have any real worries. So um, as long as things are going good, they were, they were happy to keep going. Let's, let's keep reading here. Verse number 20. Judah and Israel were many as the sand, which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. So we see it's just a very prosperous time. They didn't have any real problems. There was no famines. There was no pestilence. There was no wars. They were just able to live their life, eat, drink, and be merry and just be happy. Great time in the, in, the, in the history of Israel. Verse number 21, And Solomon reigned over all kingdoms, from the river unto the land of the Philistines, and unto the border of Egypt. They brought presents and served Solomon all the days of his life. And Solomon's provision for one day, now look at this, Solomon's provision, his food, what he required for, for one day, 
one day out of the year was 30 measures of fine flour. That might not mean very much to you. And three score measures of meal, 60 measures of meal. That might not mean that much to you, but how about this? 10 fat oxen. Now, think about like a cow. Do you know how much meat you can get from a cow, just from one cow? I mean, that's enough to feed like my family for the whole year. When I go out hunting and, we, and I get an elk, if I get a big, and this is, this is a fat oxen. This isn't just like your normal one. These are the, you know, like the fatted calf. These are the ones that they're feeding and fattening up on purpose to get that much more meat. So he's getting 10 fat oxen and 20 oxen out of the pasture. So you got the 10 fat ones in addition to 20 more. That's a lot of food. And this is, this is one day, mind you. This isn't for a week. This isn't for a month. This is one day. 10 fat oxen, 20 oxen out of the pastures and 100 sheep. Beside hearts and roebucks and fallow deer and fatted fowl. I mean, he had chicken, he had deer, he had his venison, he had, you know, just this whole spread every single day. A hundred sheep. That's a lot. But think about that. That's a, that's a lot of wealth. That's just a lot of blessing. He had a lot of people working for him. Obviously, it wasn't just set in front of Solomon, like at his dinner table. This is to support the whole, the cabinet, all these officers, their families, their, you know, basically everyone in that whole kingdom, uh, you know, the, that hub, the, the government basically was supporting all of them. But still, that's, that's quite a bit. And, and it's, it goes to show that the wealth that they had in order to provide for them and the different regions basically were tasked one month out of the year to provide this for him. And that's, and that's where it was coming from. So they would get, get one twelfth basically of the, you know, split up into 12 areas. Verse 24, for he had dominion over all the region on this side of the river from Tifza even to Azza over all the kings on this side of the river, and he had peace on all sides round about him. And Judah and Israel dwelt safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Great time again, time of peace. Look at verse number 26, though. So. And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. Now, you say, why are we pointing out this verse? Well, keep your finger here. Turn, if you would, to... 2 Chronicles chapter 9. <coughs> the reason why we're stopping here is that there are some people who like to point out supposed errors in the Bible. Especially in the King James Bible, they like to point out errors because people like us believe that the Bible is inerrant, that there are no errors in God's Word, that if there are errors, if there are contradictions, then it's not God's Word because God doesn't make mistakes. But what people like to do is we'll say, well, see, no, this is wrong. This is, this is, this is an error. This is a contradiction. So we're going to look at it. And I just want to point this out tonight because we're in this chapter. And this is one of the verses that gets brought up. So we saw the Bible says Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. 40,000. Remember that number. 2 Chronicles chapter 9, look at verse number 25. Bob reads, and Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots and 12,000 horsemen whom he bestowed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. So the, the argument is, well, 2 Chronicles 9.25 says Solomon only had 4,000 stalls, but in 1 Kings chapter 4, it says he had 40,000. So they say, see, there was a scribe error there. One of the scribes wrote down 4,000 and he should have wrote 40,000 or so one of them wrote 40 and he should have said four. But it's not a scribe error. This is exactly right. You say, well, how can that be? Well, you need to read a little bit more closely. Let's take a look at what the verse is saying. Again, 1 Kings chapter 4. And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots. So the stalls of horses. The stalls were stalls that contained the horses. Second Chronicles 9.25, and Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. He had stalls, because you think about a chariot's going to have, and, and you know, people can criticize for this, I don't know the exact number, it's going to have like six or eight or ten, however many horses for that one chariot, right? 
It's not one horse per chariot. You're going to have multiple horses, what they had, a team of horses to carry a chariot. So the 40,000 souls were for a horse, an individual horse. There's 40,000, all, you know, all for the individual horses. But he had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots that these are, I would, I would assume that these are going to be like ready to go. I mean, they're ready to go at, at a moment's notice. They've got a stall lined up. 4,000 of them that can contain the horses and the chariots. So when you read it close enough and just see what it is, because that's what it says. I mean, 2 Chronicles 9.25, and Solomon had 4,000 stalls for horses and chariots. Not just for horses, for the horses and chariots, as opposed to the 40,000 stalls for the horses. There is no contradiction here. There is no problem it gels just fine. And they're not even, they're not exactly the same. Like, it's somewhat parallel when you read 2 Chronicles 9, 25, or chapter 9, verses 1 Kings 4, but it's not exactly the same. There's all kinds of different information in the one chapter versus the other. You know, you read Jude or in 2 Peter chapter 2, and, you know, those are like parallel passages. You can read the four Gospels, and those are parallel passages passages in the Bible, basically, where they're go covering some of the same content, but you're always you're getting extra information that's not found in the other one, and it's not a contradiction, it's just a matter of detail on, on which one is going into more detail than the other. In 2 Chronicles chapter 9, you're going to see all about the, 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 the Queen of Sheba, you're going to see how, how she comes and visits Solomon and everything else. We don't see that in 1 Kings chapter 4 at all. It just says that he receives gifts and people look to him for wisdom and stuff, but there's that much more detail in chapter 9. So they're, they're covering different topics. These two verses are very similar, but it's not saying the same exact thing. It's giving you a little bit different detail on the one versus the other. And as long as I'm covering this, I'm going I'm to turn to one more. This isn't in, uh, in 1 Kings chapter 4, but what I was preparing for, I just figured I'd go over one more contradiction, well, supposed contradiction. But this has more to do, not as much of a contradiction within the King James Bible as it is something that just the, the modern perversions have changed. And uh, you could flip, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 13. And I'm going to look it up. I got the non-inspired version right here. 1 Samuel chapter 13. I mean, as long as I'm on the topic of, you know, being King James only and, you know, people want to criticize that and try to attack that with stupid, um, or with the, what they can claim to be errors or, in, or inconsistencies or, or what have you. Look, I've, I've said this before. I'll say it again. I've studied a lot of those. I'm not afraid to look at those. I'm actually just fine being challenged on things. But every single, every single supposed contradiction I've ever seen and looked at and studied, there's always a very, very valid reason for what it says. And it's never because the Bible is wrong in its translation. Ever. Not one time. I've never been convinced of that one time. And I, will, I have happily looked at whatever people want to claim as a contradiction. I've gone seeking them out. What are people saying? Hey, what are you, what, you know, give me the best of the best. What are you saying is a contradiction in the Bible? What are you saying is an error? What are you saying is wrong? I'm interested in it. I'll look at it. I've looked at it many times in the past. Without fail, I could honestly say this, not just to deceive myself, not just, well, Pastor Burson just wants the Bible to be right so bad that he'll just accept any answer that just comes his way to just, to just reinforce his own belief. That's not true. You believe me or not, but I, I, have, had, I have sufficient evidence every single time looking up, what is this actually talking about? Is there a supposed contradiction? Is there not? I have not found one to this point. And you know what? If you think you have one, bring it to me. I'd like to, I'll, I'll look at it. Now, I'm not going to respond to every single comment when this goes up on the internet and just reply to everybody because I don't have time for that. But if anyone in this church wants to bring up any, any issues to me, then I'm more than happy to go over it. Because I'm the pastor of this church. I'm not the pastor of the internet. <laughs> 1 Samuel 13, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Saul reigned one year, and when he had reigned two years over Israel, and it goes on and, and just talks about it. Now, that statement makes a lot of sense. Not much to be questioned there, right? Saul reigned for a year, 
And when he had reigned two years over Israel, he had done thus and so, right? And this is what he did. Well, and this is one of the reasons why it's so important. We're King James only. You read the, the, the NIV, the not inspired version, and, and all the modern translations basically, but I've got this one right here. This says, verse number one, Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. That's what it says. Now, King James, Saul reigned one year, and when he reigned two years over Israel, versus Saul was 30 years old when he became king, and he reigned over Israel 42 years. Not even close to the same thing at all. I mean, completely different. And you know what's interesting here is when you read this, now, a lot of people don't read, when you know, people are reading the NIVs, they're not reading it very carefully. They've got in this one, 30 is in these weird little underscore bracket things, and 40 is in these underscore bracket things. You know why? Because they just simply added that to the text. They added it. They put a footnote here, but they just added the word 30 and they added the word 40 just out of nowhere. It's like they pulled it out of a hat. Their little footnote says, a few late manuscripts of the Septuagint, semicolon, which I don't even know what that means. It says, Hebrew does not have 30. So no Hebrew. Basically, they're saying that they found this somewhere in the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the, the Greek rendering of the Old Testament, and, um, but that already is in question. I don't believe that, that you know, the Septuagint isn't, isn't accurate, um, an accurate translation necessarily in all areas, and that's why we rely on the Hebrew. But this isn't found in any, in, it's in zero Hebrew manuscripts the words 30 and 40, but they just inserted it there. And they say, we found it in some late Septuagint. So not even early, but some late manuscripts. This is a few late manuscripts of the Septuagint as their justification for putting that, those numbers in there, 30 and 40. And you know what's even funny about that is that it says he reigned, Saul reigned over Israel 42 years. Well, now you do have a contradiction. Right. Because in Acts 13, Verse 21, the Bible says that Saul reigned for 40 years, right. not 42 years. Right. So they've, they've inserted words here that was not found in any manuscript in the Hebrew, not found in Scripture at all, but they just added these words in here because they didn't like what it, you know, how it was rendering. They couldn't understand it. And they decided to just fill it in with their own words, even though it was never there to begin with. That's right. They created, when man gets involved, when they think they know, when they say, oh, this must be a mistake, I'm going to correct it. What do they do? They pervert God's word. They screw it up. They make, they make a, a, a contradiction within the Bible. And what they say is, oh, well, in Acts, it's just, a, it's just a round number. How do you know it was 42? You have no, they have no evidence anywhere in Scripture to say it was 42 years. What we do have is Acts 13 that says 40. So I just want to point that out. You know, these things, you might say, well, that's not that big of a deal. Look, it's God's word. Did, did God say this or not? You know, did he say Saul reigned one year and when he reigned two years over Israel? Or is God, the Holy Spirit saying, well, Saul was 30 years old when he began to reign. He reigned for 42 years. They're two completely different statements. And you could argue the, the importance of that. But I would say that every word of God is pure and every word of God is important. You know, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. That's the importance that Jesus put on it. That's the importance that I put on it. I don't want to have this Bible where I just have to wonder, well, if that's not right, then what else isn't right? Don't be deceived by these, these modern perversions that are out there. Let's go back to 1 Kings chapter 4. Verse number 27, And those officers provided victual for King Solomon, and for all that came unto Solomon's table, every man in his month, they lacked nothing. So again, he had the 12 officers that were in charge. They collected the taxes to pay for the king and his household. Everything was going well. There's peace. People are eating, drinking, and making merry. So paying the tax isn't really that big of a deal. It says they lacked nothing. 
there was no deficit, right? They weren't running a deficit. Everything was, was going just fine. And um, sounds like they were eating pretty well. Verse number 28. Barley also and straw for the horses and dromedaries brought they unto the place where the officers were, every man according to his charge. So they're feeding, you know, they're obviously feeding all the animals as well um, and taking care of them. Verse 29. And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much and largest of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. So not only did God bless Solomon with this, with this wisdom and understanding, but he also gave him a big heart. Solomon cared about a lot of things. He cared about people. He cared, uh, um, he cared about the kingdom. And um, he had a love for a lot of things. Excuse me, verse number 30. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. You know, whatever the world has to offer as far as wisdom goes, you know, we, we get these people that, I mean, all throughout history, you have these, these great minds, right? I mean, your Albert Einsteins are now, you know, people like to, to put these, these other God-haters up as, as these great minds and these real intellectuals. Well, when God gives someone wisdom, their wisdom far exceeds them. Just like in the book of Daniel. Daniel, um, um, and the three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Sorry, I had a brain fart for a second. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, were wiser than all of the other, you know, wise men in the entire realm. And the entire, you know, and all of Babylon and all their astrologers and their stargazers and you know, the prognosticators and all these people that they had with all of the world's wisdom were no match for the people who actually had God's wisdom. Right. And this is, this is historical fact. Same thing in 1 Kings with Solomon. God poured out wisdom upon Solomon. He gave him this understanding way wiser than anyone else in the entire world. In fact, people actually made journeys and trips to just talk to him and to hear the wisdom of Solomon. It says in verse 31, for he was wiser than all men, than Ethan. And this is, now it just names off some of these, these men apparently at that time that were regarded as having a lot of wisdom. Ethan the Ezrahite and Heman and Chalcol and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all nations round about. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. He, he put a lot of wisdom out there. Now it says here that he spake 3,000 proverbs, which means that not all of his proverbs were recorded. Not all of his proverbs were considered the Word of God. Now we have Scripture in the Proverbs that we just got done with our previous Bible study going through all the Proverbs. And I went through and I counted how many verses there were for each chapter and, and, and put them all together. The entire book of Proverbs, if I counted right, there's 915 verses. It says here, and not every verse is necessarily its own proverb, right? But So just remember that. But that's, there's only 915 verses in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, but it says here he spake 3,000 Proverbs. So he had a lot of wisdom to teach in that in that was given unto the people. And, there's, and if you want to count Ecclesiastes, I counted that too. There's 222 verses in Ecclesiastes also, if you want to kind of lump, because they're almost like Proverbs, not exactly the same. But he gave, he, he had a lot of wisdom to share. And his songs, I mean, 1,005, he's a real talented guy that, that God gave him these gifts in order to do that. And um, even though these Proverbs are not Scripture, you know, there's these other 2,000 or however many more he had, it still doesn't make them without value. There's still a lot to be learned, a lot to be gained from the wisdom that he had. It's not, it's not straight Word of God, but there's still a lot of wisdom that we can gain about many things. There's many, there's many areas that we can gain knowledge of that is, is actually valuable for our life. Let's look here in verse number 33. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes. And there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth, which had heard of his wisdom. Now turn, if you would, to Job 38. And we're just going to read this real briefly just because I got a little bit, we're, we're doing good on time. We're almost done. I mean, the sermon's almost over. 
But turn, if you would, to Job. Just before the book of Psalms, we have the book of Job. And what I want to point out here is just with this wisdom, with the knowledge that he had, he had these extra proverbs, he had this extra wisdom that wasn't just, you know, wasn't pure scripture, but it was good knowledge to have. And then it says he was able to speak of these trees and these animals, and he had good knowledge of all the, you know, the way all these different things work. And it was useful and it was beneficial. And what we find in Job 38 and Job 39, I'm just going to kind of skim through these. This is when God is answering Job out of the world. When Job, Job or, um, you know, and God's kind of rebuking him a little bit. But some of the things that he mentions, actually, just go to, uh, go to verse number, or excuse me, go to chapter 39. I'm just going to skim through 39. Or at the end of chapter 38, he says, um, you know, who can number the clouds? Verse 37, who can number the clouds in wisdom? Or who can stay the bottles of heaven when the dust groweth in the hardness and the clods cleave fast together? Wilt thou hunt the prey for the lion or fill the appetite of the young lions when they couch in their dens and abide in the covert to lie in wait? Who provideth for the raven his food when his young ones cry unto God? They wander for lack of meat. Verse 1 of, of 39, knowest thou the time when the wild goats of the rock bring forth? Or canst thou mark when the hinds do calve? Canst thou number the months that they fulfill? Or knowest thou the time when they bring forth? They bow themselves, they bring forth their young ones, they cast out their sorrows. Their young ones are in good liking. They grow up with corn, they go forth and return not unto them. Who hath sent out the wild ass free? Or who hath loosed the bands of the wild ass? Whose house... I have made the wilderness and the barren land is dwelling. Uh, jump down there to verse number 9. Will the unicorn be willing to serve thee or abide by thy crib? Canst thou bind the unicorn with his band in the furrow? Or will he harrow the valleys after thee? Verse number 13. Gavest thou the goodly wings on the peacocks or wings on the feathers on the ostrich? Uh, which leaveth her eggs in the earth and warmeth them in the dust and forgetteth that the foot may crush them or that the wild beast may break them. She is hardened against her young ones as though they were not hers. Her labor is in vain without fear because God hath deprived her of wisdom. Neither hath he imparted her understanding. Verse number 19, Hast thou given the horse strength? Hast thou clothed his neck with thunder? Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. Um, and on and on. And, and, you know, verse 26, that the hawk fly by thy wisdom and stretch out her wings toward the south. Let the eagle mount up at thy command and make her nest on high. And he, he mentions all of these various, you know, animals. It talks about, you know, Pleiades, the bands of Orion, and, and just, just all of the various things that happen in nature, in God's creation. And He's saying, do you know this? Do you know how all this stuff works? Do you know how, how the hinds calve? Do you, do you know how these things happen? Because God has it. Because God has all wisdom and all knowledge. But he's using these things saying, well, do you, do you know about this? Do you know about that? It's good wisdom to have. I mean, I'm all for learning science and getting knowledge. And the Bible exalts getting wisdom. That's why we have the book of Proverbs. The Bible says that, that wisdom is a principal thing. And this is also why we homeschool. And this is why I promote homeschooling. Because wisdom is important. Because knowledge is important. You know, there's a, there's a false belief out there. It's kind of going away because it's being more culturally accepted for people to be homeschooling. But a lot of times people will think that you're either weird because you're homeschooling or the child's not going to get a very good education as they would in the public school or they're in some institution somewhere. When actually it's the opposite that's true. They actually get, children get better educations typically. I mean, by and large, you always have some, some outliers. But if you're doing your job, your child's going to get way, way more wisdom and knowledge and education at home under the care of their parents. And not only that, as homeschooling, you know, I want my children to be smart. I want them to have a good education. That's why I don't want to send them to the, to the government, you know, um, factory of, of how to think and how not to challenge authority and how not to challenge and critically think about things. It's ridiculous how much the kids these days going into these public schools don't understand how to, how to critically think. Right. They're just told, this is the way it is, and you accept it. 
I mean, for the longest time, I went to public school for my whole life, even through college. And before I got saved, I used to, you know, I, I was really into science. I still am really into science. I'm in I'm, the, the way my brain thinks, real logical. And I was taught that evolution was a fact. I mean, it's just, I, was, I, I would think that if you didn't believe in evolution, you're an idiot. You're uneducated. You don't know anything. How could you be so stupid? And that's the way it was taught to me. And you know what I wasn't taught? How to think critically. Right. I was taught, this is the way it is. That's it. Don't challenge anything. Don't ask the questions. Well, <laughs> what? Are you stupid? You know, and get that type of an attitude back if you did try to, try to question things. So... That was the same attitude that rubbed off on me because I didn't think very critically. And it wasn't until after that, after I got saved, I realized, you know what? There's a problem here because I know what Genesis says. I mean, briefly, roughly, I knew, you know, after I got saved, it's not like I knew every verse, but I knew, I'm like, I know that the Bible teaches creation. I know that the Bible says that God created everything and that it wasn't just a big bang and everything evolved and that God made man and he made the, the animals and he made, you know, I, I had that rudimentary knowledge of the Bible. So I was like, wait a minute, there's a problem here. And then I, that started me on my course of actually challenging and thinking about things. I was saying, well, how can this be, right? How can this be? And that's when I finally started to see the answers and the things that were hidden during my education in the public school system of, of you know, just wanting to push their godless agenda more than anything. And, you know, not that every single teacher had this agenda, but it's what was in the textbooks and what was in the curriculum. It's what was taught to us. I'm not saying every teacher I had was horrible or, or evil or, or ill-intented by any means. But even just the basics of, of having a classroom you have a classroom. My classrooms were probably around 30 people in size. If you, want, if, you, if you have one teacher trying to teach 30 children who are all different from each other, people, you know, people, humans get things in different ways. You know, learn uh, some at different speeds, but some just need different examples, different illustrations to get the point across, to understand the concepts and understand what's going on. And when you got some kids that aren't learning that much and some kids who aren't doing their work at home and they're not getting the homework done and the parents aren't helping them out or whatever, you have this, this balance and basically the level is going to be taught to, if, if, you know, especially with the no child left behind thing, you know, you got to dumb down the teaching to, to the level of the, of the kid who's, who's holding everyone else back. There's all these various reasons, but the point is, you know, we ought to value wisdom. We ought to value education, value knowledge. We're not just some, some dumb Baptist that don't know nothing and all you do is got your Bible and you're just, you know, no. There's a lot of wisdom that we ought to have. Solomon had a lot of wisdom about a lot of different things. He had wisdom of animals. He had wisdom of plants. You know, it says from the big cedar trees all the way down to the little trees that are, that are popping up out of the, out of the walls. He knew a lot about all those things, and they're all good things. They're all, they're all things that, that were beneficial in some way. Obviously, we promote God's Word as the most important wisdom and the primary you know, source of, of, of our learning and education should be in this book, but that's, we don't stop there. I don't stop there. My kids are learning science. My kids are learning language skills. My kids are learning all these various things, mathematics and, and everything else. This is first. This is primary. This is the principal thing. But wisdom in general is a good thing to have. You want to be wise and have an education. And that is something that is exalted in the Bible and something that, that we ought to not uh, just brush to the side. And even my, I mean, I have three daughters and a son. Now, I don't expect that my daughters will be running businesses and doing things like that. And I, I expect them to have a biblical role and, and to probably become... Uh, housewives and, and, and have children and things like that. But whether that's what they do, even from a young age, you get married young and that's what they do, having knowledge and education and wisdom is not a bad thing. It's always a good thing. It's always going to be helpful for them. It's always going to help out their life to have the extra knowledge and things to, to, to help them in their life. I mean, even running, running the household isn't necessarily a simple thing to do. <laughs> There's a lot of ways that you could get, you can make your work more efficient and having more knowledge is going to help you to do that. So um, let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the wisdom that you've given us. And in this chapter, dear Lord, we pray that you would please help us to be diligent 
into studying out the scripture and to, and to getting to know intimately the, the different stories and the people involved, dear Lord. Help us to, to really retain some of this information that we could gain uh, greater understanding and greater truths as we read through and that we could build the precept upon precept and line upon line and, and learn that much more and learn some of the deeper things that are found in your words, dear Lord. We know that none of, nothing here is, um, is written in vain and help us to understand and gain more wisdom, uh, especially through these chapters that go through a lot of lists of names and things. God, help us to glean the, the truth and, and uh, wisdom that we could get from these chapters. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.